Under the Sea by Ashley. Some people think that the floor of the sea is flat and sandy like a beach, but it is not like a beach at all. There's not much sand at the bottom of the sea and it is not flat. There are mountains, valleys too. There are shells and other creatures and coral and fishes, rocks, crabs and many other things. In the middle of the sea are whales and big fishes. On the beach, there are schools of fish that are together. Men catch fish for tea and eat them up. There is a seaweed that the fish eat. The big fish eat the little fish. There are sunken boats of the pirates. They had treasure and gold and lots of dead pirates. There's fossils on the bottom of the sea. Maybe there is scary things like old scary skeletons. If you dig a hole, very deep water will start to come in. Maybe shells too. And the spiky sea eggs are so spiky, there's one that can kill you. Written in 1976. There's actually a re really, really rare uh, bit of footage in here of an exceptionally rare sand dollar. I only ever found it once that day, not that one. You can see how the little tube feet are actually picking up the sand grains. And see that one? Lifted it up. And that's the mouth there where the sand grains are actually about to be devoured. So the name sea urchin actually is derived from. I think it's an old Greek word for hedgehog, so sea hedgehog. Yeah. Yeah, I think the word is echinos, echinos, which is how we get the word echinoid, which is a correct term for a sea urchin, or echinoderms, which means spiny skin. So it's a, it's a Greek derivative. This is the first time I ever really got a good pencil urchin. And there's a good little shot because it sort of falls off. Well, I like to work with sea urchins every day, so um, I sort of thought, well, there must be other people that like them as much as I do, so why not provide that service and, you know, incredible quality museum-grade specimens for the general public? Um, I mean, I, I can't see why anyone wouldn't like what I have on offer here today. Actually, they're, they're burrowing sea urchins, so we don't see them very often. Uh -huh. see them yeah, they actually live probably about 10 or 15 centimetres under the sand. So is that design on them? Is that natural? It, it's actually completely natural. So those little holes there, um, when it's alive, it actually has spines that come out of the holes to oh, protect itself. Okay, yeah. there, actually, there's one there. So that's what they look like. And that's pretty much what you see there. So it's a similar um, family mm -hmm. as well. Th these actually washed up on the beach in Western Australia years ago. Wow. When there was a cyclone. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Did you collect them all? Um, I collected quite a few, so all those I did, not, not those, mm -hmm. um, although we do get that one in Sydney. We definitely get those in Sydney. Um, yeah. A lot of, uh, you know, people who wrote papers back in the 1800s describing new species, they were, they were often people who, um, they just were uh, obviously very capable of doing that and they weren't necessarily people who had degrees or anything like that or any qualifications but they were very naturally gifted to do that work. They were, they were observant um, so often it, it can be seen as a gift. As far as my situation goes I, I um, obviously put in the, the actual work and, and understood what I was doing and it was very consistent for a very long time um, and had a natural ability to um, 
you know, differentiate between species and look at very fine detail. And it sounds a bit unprofessional, but like a gut feeling that you know you're right. Actually, she got a Nudicinus darnleyensis. That's a really big one for the species. There you go, world size record. <laughs> Probably, I don't know. So that was a another additional find, which was good. So tropical thing. For example, um, when I published my second book, um, the Australian Antarctic Division contacted me and asked if I wanted to um, be a part of one of their expeditions for six months. So they didn't actually say, well, what qualifications do you have? They knew I'd published two books, they knew I was the expert, and they just, uh, at the time I said, well, you know, what, what sort of um, experience do you need and update the resume or whatever. And they said, no, you just need to tell us if you want to come. They already knew and they needed a sea urchin taxonomist um, to help. A lot of the things that you learn as a taxonomist is, is it's not in books. You know, not, not everything is necessary to go and learn through university. People have never questioned the, um, my ability ever, not once. Well, do you think it's just made up? You know, those people do. Um, this, this is a deep water species called Gonio sudaris clipiata. It lives around about 150 metres deep. And over a very long period of time, it's evolved these trumpet type uh, spines. And the, the tips actually flare out like little trumpets, and they're pink as well. Sea urchins are not very common at this size, and certainly this height. So um, it's really only known from this one species called Demokinus horridus. It lives in very deep water. So. As you can see, it's quite a large specimen. Now this one's an extraordinarily large one. It's quite a spectacular thing. Um, it looks a little bit like a landmine. And in fact, some years ago, there was a report of somebody finding some stranded specimens, probably not that big, and they thought they were landmines and they called the police. The common name I've called it is the snowflake urchin. And you can see this, this adaptation is highly unusual. It's a deep water species. And the spines have actually evolved into these dendritic structures. So they kind of look like, like tree branches. The overall effect really does look more like a snowflake. Um, so no two are alike. <laughs> I'm trying to make things interesting for people because it's an interesting group of uh, marine invertebrates that I'm dealing with here. So I came up with some you know, pretty cheesy kind of commercial names and, um, you know, like mint and orange or, you know, taste of the tropics because of the, the particular colours that it showed or, um, you know, pastel persimmon, <laughs> which is like a, a persimmon sort of coloured thing. And they kind of look like small fruits, some of them. So is that natural colour of the Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I actually prepped them myself. So when you see them sort of, they come up in fishing nets actually. So when they come up in the nets, um, they kind of look pretty old, spines are bent and mangled, but I, I, I'm very careful with how I remove all the, the tissues and the spines from them. Yeah, I actually did them yesterday. They're pretty amazing. Well, one of the common types of reactions I get is that uh, they look so alien. Um, because, you know, if you think of what, how people think of urchins as being black spined and um, the ones that they encounter a lot, this really goes so, much, so far against the the common um, image of what a sea urchin is. And I suppose the reason for that is that they're found in deeper water anyway. So um, the likelihood of finding something like that on the beach, unless it's a really, really big storm, isn't very likely. Yeah, things can be thrown up on the beach and looking quite uh, unremarkable, but when you see what is possible, it's a totally different story, you know? When you observe a sea urchin in its natural environment, probably the most you can actually see is the spines. They're the most obvious part of it. Um, but if you actually look very, very close, um, either under a microscope or high magnification camera, you can actually see a whole range of other structures. And they're actually very important for the survival of the urchin itself. So firstly, what you've got is the obvious, the spines. So the spines tend to rotate. And there's a few different types. There's the just the primary spines, which are the largest ones, and between them are these very fine spines. So they're, they're pretty much protective. That's what they do, they protect. And they, they can also walk on those spines. Between those, you have what are known as tube feet. And tube feet are extendable, soft feet, with, normally with suckered ends. 
So the sucker's on the end, a little bit like, a, I guess you could say, an octopus sucker. So it, it helps to grip firm objects um, like rocks so that it actually doesn't get washed away. And they can also use those to um, help feeding, feed itself as well. So it might grasp an object that it deems edible and then eventually transfer it to mouth with those tube feet. But the third thing, that the, the smallest part of the sea urchin surface, which is very hard to see with the naked eye, are these little poison structures. And there's a few different types of those. And they're right at the base of the spines. They're very short, but they've kind of got little, three little jaws on them. And they, they snap away at any kind of uh, marine threat. It looks like another little world when you, when you uh, observe them very, very close, at, cl at high magnification. Well, I think the most, well, it has to be my most favourite, but the most significant as well is uh, this particular heart urchin. It's from Lord Howe Island, and it's Brainia australasii. Now, this is a very abundant sea urchin in the lagoon there, but the reason why it's so important is that it was the first sea urchin that was ever given to me, uh, well, I should say the first heart urchin that was ever given to me. So it really sparked an interest because um, you can see these amazingly symmetrical patterns and um, little tubercles and all sorts of a crazy designs. So it really got me in. And that was back in 1982 when I received this actual specimen from my mother while she was holidaying on Lord Howe Island. I think really my love for the ocean started when I was very, very young, possibly three or four. Um, I was very lucky to have parents that took, uh, took the family to the beach quite frequently. So we'd get a really good opportunity to explore the tide lines or you know, have a look in rock pools and things like that. And um, I guess, you know, when you find things that are exciting and interesting and new and um, your parents can explain those to you and you keep going and going, well, you get very interested and almost, um, it would have stemmed from there, really. I, I suppose the other thing about how I became the expert on sea urchins is that um, I was always finding new things and interesting discoveries along the way, so that sort of motivates you to keep going. Um, it's never sort of come to a, an end where you think you've sort of discovered it all because you never, never really have. So that's another one. Yeah. God, that's amazing. It's so significant to find that bloody thing. And some really cool stuff in here too. Um, just give me a sec. I'm not... Uh... There's always some species that you've found in a place where you wouldn't find it or some variety you've never seen before or you go to some place where Perhaps you thought there wasn't anything there and you find out the opposite was true. So um, it's um, a never-ending never um, voyage of discovery, really. So this find is quite significant. This is a, it's only a fragment, but it's a, a recently dead specimen of Lavinia elongata. Now this is a very tropical species that we're now finding in Sydney Harbour. So you know, you'd expect it sort of in the areas of northwestern Australia or north Queensland. And generally in those areas, it lives in shallower water, but here it's probably more like five to 10 meters. Right, so this is really significant as well. This is the sand dollar Pipiaster reticulatus. Now this is the one that was first discovered here in Sydney Harbour in about 2011. And ever since that time, I found live specimens on every single scuba dive. It hasn't disappeared over the cooler months. It seems to have been reproducing. Um, this, you know, prior to finding it here, the southernmost um, distribution limit was actually uh, Morton Bay off uh, Brisbane. So it's, a, it's about nearly a thousand kilometres south of its previously recorded distribution limit. Well, I suppose since 1995, I've noticed quite a few changes. Firstly, the water temperature in winter is now warmer. So when I was diving probably in 1995, it was around the coldest it ever got to was about 13 degrees. Um, probably in the last couple of years, it's been around about 17. But um, so from that point of view, I think it's been quite consistently higher than when I first started. So the type of species that I'm seeing, not only with sea urchins, but also with mollusks, 
uh, that they're, they're from tropical Queensland sort of areas and they're now in the harbour. When it was colder, the species used to, you know, they'd, they'd turn up and then they'd sort of struggle to grow over the winter months. They might survive and they'd die off and they wouldn't actually reproduce because there's probably not that many of them around. It might be a one-off. But um, there, there are enough of these to actually, you know, make a colony, if you like, and, and uh, keep reproducing. It's very difficult to say from this point onwards what, the, what will be happening down there. The sea floor is very changeable, so uh, I guess we have to really wait and see. What I'm looking for today is this is the world's smallest sea urchin species. Uh, the name of that species is Fibularia nutrians. Grows to around about two and a half millimeters, three millimeters maximum, I would say. And you can actually find it in this sort of habitat. That one's too big. I might just um, dig around here a little bit. There's a lot of micro mollusks in this sample. Like little gastropods, like really tiny ones here. So the search today went, I mean, it, it went fine. I mean, I, I think I certainly covered a lot of the sample to pretty much uh, determine that uh, what we were looking for we didn't find today, but that's okay. I mean, it's not always about having success on the first time you do something. It's about, you know, the ongoing process of, of being able to, um, you know, find what you want eventually by actually putting the work into it. So, um, and it's also about, you know, not, not giving up and, you know, making sure that you don't make excuses for not doing something. For example, you know, the water's too cold or, um, you know, I've got, I feel tired or whatever. You still got to get in and do it. But after a while, those things sort of work themselves out and you can, you can kind of, um, you know, condition yourself to, to doing what you need to do to, to find all these amazing discoveries. I mean, at some point, somebody has to be the first to do something. Uh, and if I think back years ago when I'm, I was at one of the Australian Museum open days back in 87, I asked one of the scientists there, um, I said, well, how far up into Sydney Harbour can you find sea urchins, you know, towards the fresher water like Parramatta River? And they said, well, we, we don't really know. No one's ever actually had a look. Um, probably because it's too dangerous because of the maybe bull sharks or whatever time of year and also uh, low visibility and whatever else or boat traffic but that sort of spurred me on to wanting to um, find out for myself I wanted to actually get in that water and, and see what's down there so um, I think at the time the last survey of echinoderms done in Sydney Harbour was about 1890 so that was 18 uh, sorry 1987 so there's a long period of time to have passed before I actually um, did it for myself but when I got uh, trained in scuba and went and had a look for myself. Uh, it was evident that there was a lot more diversity down there in not just sea urchins but you know mollusks and uh, everything else down there. You know you, it's good to find out things for yourself. I don't like to be said, oh, I don't like to be told, oh, you know, how do you, you know, prep that 
urchin or where can you find it? Like I'd, I'd like to go out and find it, find the habitat, observe it, photograph. Um, I don't think anyone would be willing to pay me to go and do that for years and years. So uh, you have to really do it yourself and then you know, record that data, photograph and uh, produce books. And um, obviously the work comes along once you're um, an expert in that field. If people change their mindset, perhaps to somehow convincing themselves that they can really do anything if they put in the effort and the consistent. And if they have the, the, an interest, they've got to have an interest that is um, something that they can maintain. So it's got to be that interesting to keep wanting to do it. All right, so if my memory serves me well, there'll be a fade out here and that'll be the end of it. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. Oh, it's got the date. Look at the scribble out. <laughs> wow. How professional is that? <laughs>